to break all this down. We're very happy to have with us Aaron Mate, who's a journalist at The Gray Zone and the host of The Pushback with Aaron Mate. Aaron, thank you so much for being with us. I feel bad. You guys are doing so good keeping your show Russiagate free. <laughs> and I'm yeah, it's been I'm a while, the party. right? I'm spoiling the party. No, it's it's all it's all good. I have a little PTSD when I think about Russia Gate, but overall, <laughs> very happy to be able to genuinely. do it. Genuinely. <laughs> so, Aaron, we've got you know the sort of fruits or some of the fruits of the investigation by Mister Durham and the Justice Department into the origins, essentially, of Russia Gate that have been coming out. Uh, there have been some some legal proceedings that have taken place. You know, help us understand the contours of what we're learning from this Durham investigation about the genesis of how Russiagate as we know it began? What we're confirming is what, you know, people like all of us here were saying from the start that this whole Russiagate thing was a scam. It was cooked up by the Clinton campaign and pursued by allied people inside the national security state and, you know, spread throughout the world by a really credulous media that didn't look at the available facts and instead wanted to advance this fashionable narrative that Russia was destroying U.S. democracy with its sophisticated Facebook ads and email hackers, and that Donald Trump and everyone he knew were somehow complicit, uh, including by blackmail that Putin was, was, was hanging over Trump. And now we're learning basically how the scam was concocted. And one of the key ways was for the Clinton campaign to hire this firm called Fusion GPS, which in turn hired a former British spy named Christopher Steele, who hates Russia, has a real animus towards Russia. He thinks Russia wants to destroy the world and he sees a conspiracy everywhere. He basically invented this fake dossier full of claims about the P tape and, you know, Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer going to Prague to pay off Russian hackers. And instead of this dossier being laughed at by the media and the FBI, they use this as source material. So the FBI got this dossier at some point in 2016. And when they went to a FISA court to start, uh, trying to get wiretap applications on a Trump associate named Carter Page, they cited the Steele dossier four times, even after they started learning that it was all fiction and paid for by the Clinton campaign. And the media portrayed Steele, instead of being this mentally unstable Russophobe, as this credible sleuth who had uncovered the real truth about Trump and Russia and just wanted to warn the world. And they still persisted with that even when it was discovered in late 2017 that the Clinton campaign was paying for it. And now what we're learning from these indictments is that basically, you know, whereas Steele claimed to have access to all these high-level Kremlin sources, he actually had access to one guy named Igor Danchenko, who he's, he, he has a Russian passport. The problem is he lives in the U.S. And instead of having access to the Kremlin, he has much better access to the Beltway. He worked at a, a think tank called the Brookings Institution, which is also, by the way, heavily tied to the Clintons. And that was his main guy. And Danchenko was giving him all these ridiculous moronic claims about, you know, a P-tape and blah, blah, blah. And that's what was going into the dossier. And we learned from this new indictment of Danchenko that he lied to the FBI in misleading them about his conversations with people who he used as subsources, one of whom he didn't even speak to. So Danchenko claimed he spoke to this one guy named Sergei Milian, who's not even Russian, he's Belarusian, but he was the head of the Russian-American Chamber of <laughs> Commerce. But... It turns out they didn't even speak. So it's just one, it, it's, it's one uh, way to, it's one window into how this giant scam was concocted. You know, Aaron, it's so fascinating how every few months it's like another piece of this Russia gate narrative. And this has been going on for years, but every few months for the last several years, another piece of this narrative that literally every single major media outlet in America and really more like the Western world has confirmed is true. Another piece just falls apart at this point. It's like, is there, there's almost nothing else left to hold this fraudulent narrative narrative together. Yet if you're watching the mainstream press, no one's been held accountable. No outlet has come out and said they were wrong. In fact, if I turn on any late night show, it's like, they're still perpetuating this myth. It's like, no matter what we find out was untrue, it becomes truer. Like, what does it say <laughs> about our media apparatus and really our entire country that, you know, at least with Iraq WMDs, like they were like, oh, okay, there was no WMDs. We got it wrong. With this, there's been no accountability and no, you know, 
no moment of people coming out and doing sort of like their mea culpes. What it says is that our intelligentsia is basically a cult. And, you know, <laughs> in this case of Russiagate, the narrative served such a convergence of powerful interests that it's just too big to fail. So, you know, the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, which is the dominant wing, which, you know, so many elite journalists and establishment news outlets identify with, they came up with this to basically deflect blame for losing to a buffoon, Donald Trump. Um, among many other uh, interests that it served for them. This dovetailed with the national security state who didn't care that Trump was a racist or a misogynist, but he was just too erratic. Sometimes he actually blurted out honest things and he said the truth. And he just was not a a suitable steward for the global U.S. empire. And to top it off, he also was sometimes talking about cooperating with Russia, which was sort of like um, treated as venom from people in the national security state who wanted to increase confrontations with Russia, didn't want to cooperate with Russia in Syria, for example, didn't want to reach a deal with Russia and Ukraine, wanted to continue cold wars and dirty, war, and, and dirty wars all around the world. And peace with Russia is an impediment to that. And then the media, too, this was great for them because they actually helped elect Trump. They gave him billions of dollars worth of free airtime. And uh, this allowed them to deflect responsibility for their own uh, culpability in electing Trump. Uh, instead, they could blame it on Russian bots. And m- moreover, all of them could put forward this narrative that distracted the public from real genuine dysfunctions, genuine dysfunctions that allowed a clown like Trump to get elected in the first place. And to look at those dysfunctions seriously would have meant questioning the capitalist system that all these powerful sectors enjoy power and privilege in. So it was just like this perfect convergence of nefarious, cynical elite interest. And that's why I think it's just too big to fail. And that's why like Russia gators will not stop Russia gating. I mean, it it really is a cult. So now the new narratives, all right, steel got it wrong, but the rest of it was right. And the reason steel got it wrong is not because, you know, steel is like a deranged Russo foe, but because he was fooled by this Russian who was feeding him Russian disinformation. It's they always find a way to avoid responsibility and blame Russia. I mean, you know, it's one of these Things, Aaron, that it almost, it's like you can't make it up when you sort of, I mean, you're just, even your initial capsule, I almost felt like I was through the looking glass, like, is this real? And, you know, I wonder, what does this also say about institutions like the FBI and others who it seems really expressed basically no disbelief at all when this was brought to them and sort of pushed on them and generally sort of jumped in to, to confirm? I mean, it says that the the intelligence community has a major problem both with lying to the public, which we already knew, but also with extreme, I think, Cold War chauvinism, where if you read some of the reporting from places like the New York Times, they talk about the reasons why the FBI was able to pursue this and turn this into this like all-consuming national security investigation of a presidential campaign and then a president is because It wasn't just things like the Steele dossier, but also they were seeing Trump on the campaign trail talk about getting along with Russia and also criticizing NATO. And in their minds, they just couldn't process that someone could actually believe those things genuinely, that the only only explanation must be that they have to be some kind of potential Kremlin agent. And if you read their statements, I mean, they, they really are bigots when it comes to Russia. James Clapper, who was the head of national intelligence at the time of Russiagate, when the Russiagate investigation began, he said that Russians are genetically predisposed to lying, which is really ironic for James Clapper, who lied to Congress about (laughs) spying on Americans. I mean, that's why Edward Snowden leaked the documents when he saw James Clapper lying. Clapper also, during the Iraq war, claimed that uh, when he was a part of a naval intelligence wing, said that there was evidence of Saddam moving weapons of mass destruction into Syria. Um, People like uh, uh, Peter Strzok, who's the FBI agent who opened up the Trump-Russia investigation, he sent all these text messages where he's saying stuff like, I hate the effing Russian, the cheating effing savages. Like, these people were, were deranged. And the fact that you have this, the, the, this strange uh, character Trump freestyling his way to the presidency, while at the same time saying occasionally nice things about Russia and criticizing NATO, it just combined into this perfect storm where it became, for some reason— a legitimate move to investigate a presidential campaign and then fuel innuendo for three years that he was a Russian asset. And 
I'm I'm curious, Aaron. Like, I think uh, your thoughts on this because it seems to me like this entire Russia Gate narrative, even if it were to disappear tomorrow, we never heard about it ever again. There's a certain level of damage that it's done to like the psyche of Americans, um, because Americans have basically like been taught to overnight become fearful of any enemy that the FBI or whatever intelligence agency decides to say, like, did a cyber attack or did some invisible attack we can't see. So, like, today it's Russia, tomorrow it's Iran, the next day it's China, the next day it's Venezuela. They're all the big disinformation narrative. Like, that's the other thing that was fueled by Russiagate, this narrative that we have a disinformation problem, and it's been used to justify basically, like, all this censorship supposedly of the far right, but really it just ends up being like people like us that get censored and suppressed. But I guess my question is, what is the overall damage that Russia gate has done to America aside from just the issue of like, which is a big deal of militarizing the situation between the U S and Russia, but it goes beyond that. Right. Oh my God. There's so much damage. I mean, look, the military, the, uh, damage to U.S.-Russia relations was really big. I mean, U.S.-Russia relations were already pretty bad, but they got even worse because part of the problem was this narrative that Trump was a Russian puppet. It incentivized everyone who believed in it to ignore the real actions that Trump was taking that were increasing tensions with Russia. So, you know, launching a coup in Russia's ally, Venezuela, tearing up vital nuclear treaties, increasing war games on uh, Russia's borders, uh, bombing uh, Russia's ally Syria twice. I mean, uh, the U.S. media invo- avoided all these issues even more because they undermined the fashionable narrative that Trump was really doing Putin's bidding. And yeah, when it comes to the impact on the left, I mean, look, uh, basically Russian disinformation and uh, Russia's uh, Russian interference was basically turned into meaning anyone who the bipartisan U.S. establishment doesn't want. So first it was Trump, and then in 2020 during the Democratic primary, they Russiagated Bernie. Uh, Bernie. They claim that uh, Vladimir Putin wants to install Ber- uh, Bernie as well, which is obvious. It was, it was obvious all along that that what was going on. It wasn't just a fake way to resist Trump. It was also a way to protect the power of the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party and basically suppress anyone deemed to be a threat to that. And look, a great example that I always give is that it meant that during the Trump era, there were bigger rallies to save Jeff Beauregard Sessions' job than there were to you know save Obamacare or save the Iran nuclear deal. And liberal energies were diverted into this like ridiculous reality show. And it meant worshiping the CIA and the FBI and trying to fight to save the job of Jeff Sessions. I think that says it all. (laughs) You know, it really does. I I remember Sessions trying to present himself as some sort of like, you know, martyr, like I resisted, whatever. I mean, truly one of the most execrable people to ever sit in the United States. (gasps) Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, I was just going to remind you that Rachel Maddow was like cheering on Jeff Sessions as a hero of America when yeah, was and, he pushed out or resigned? Was fired, I mean, she was, <laughs> when he was fired, she was like, this is a break the fire glass moment. This is an emergency. All hands on deck. And they had these big <laughs> protests that the liberals rallied. I, you know, I, I went to one of them in New York. It was, it was sad. Like we're rallying for Jeff Sessions. Because, uh, and for people who don't know, the fear was that the firing of Jeff Sessions meant that Robert Mueller's job was in danger. Robert Mueller, another upstanding character who, you know, went Whatever to Congress and claimed that Trump had WMD. He rounded up uh, Muslim immigrants after 9-11. Uh, you know, he was turned into a savior figure overnight until, of course, he appeared publicly in Congress in July 2019. And he didn't even know the details of, of his own investigation. It was, it was another sad display. It really was. And and the perverse incentive structure at all. I mean, all these people are writing books. I, I, you know, I don't read many of the books, but they're getting millions of dollars in advances that, I mean, it's, and Rania mentioned this earlier. I mean, not only are people continuing to push the lie, they're actually profiting in, in huge sums for doing it. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that's what you need to get people pushing lies. But it does seem to really <laughs> speak to just the overall feedback loop and kind of the mili- the, mili- the media, book publishing, politics nexus that exists in our current moment. Absolutely. And and also it speaks to what Ronnie was talking about, about this disinformation obsession. It's also meant this new kind of cottage industry of like spook firms who like get paid millions of dollars to reproduce reports about Russian disinformation and or Chinese disinformation, basically anything that can be used to 
gin up fear about whatever the official enemy is of the day. And one of those firms is this thing called New Knowledge. It's full of ex-State Department people. They've since changed their name because that's like a hallmark of these shady firms like Blackwater. They always change their name like every year. But they were they wrote up a report for the Senate about like the, the danger of Russian trolls, right? And they include the actual screenshots of the Russian Facebook ads that supposedly destroyed our democracy. And there's this one ad where there's like some, it's, there's an image of Jesus consoling a young man and the young man looks very upset. And Jesus says to him, if you're having problems with masturbation, reach out to Jesus and we'll beat it together. Right. And so these, these Senate contracted spooks, okay. Writing in an official Senate report, like the Senate stamp is on this report. Okay. It says that this was an example in their words of the Russia's recruitment strategy where Russia was exploiting Americans vulnerable to masturbation to try to recruit assets. I mean, this is the level of idiocy <laughs> and profiteering that Russiagate produced. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. And, and but, after, you know, after, after, yeah, after Aaron, serious. we're going to be bringing on several victims of, of that ad who were recruited by <laughs> Russia <laughs> after they, I mean, imagine actually believing that Jesus, I mean, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Should be here all weekend, folks. Uh, I, wow. I mean, if, that's wow. That's, I don't even really know what to do with that. That's wow. I mean, yeah. It, only in an agreed upon fiction could that really survive to where people would somehow feel comfortable putting that in a Senate report. But it does speak to, I mean, I know some people have called it Russia derangement syndrome and it's a little tongue in cheek, but I mean, it does have a certain sort of ring to it because it is funny, but then you do remember that like, whoa, wait a second, millions of people actually believe this and are acting on the basis that this is true. It is. And again, I, I keep going back to what a lost opportunity, the whole four year thing was for the Bernie movement. Like think about 2016. Okay. So you have these emails coming out showing that the DNC and Clinton campaign, they hate Bernie. They hate his movement. They hate his supporters. They're conspiring against him. They're rigging the primary Hillary Clinton saying one thing in public uh, and then saying another thing in private to wall street. And then not only that they lose. Okay. They lose to, they can't beat Donald Trump, which should have ended their political uh, movement forever. They lost to Trump. What happens instead? Hillary Clinton and her campaign, they start blaming Russia. They come up with conspiracy theories that Trump is a Russian agent. And the Bernie movement, led by Bernie, instead of saying, this is bullshit, uh, and sorry, you guys lost. It's time to just accept that, and now it's time for a new party. They accepted the Russiagate narrative. They propped it up. Bernie Sanders introduced a measure to stop Russian interference. He speculated, like everyone else, that you know Trump was compromised by Russia. And, of course, he didn't Russiagate to the extent that like Nancy Pelosi did. Because Nancy Pelosi had this famous mantra, she said all the time that when it comes to Trump, all roads lead to Putin. That li- that's literally her mantra. Mm-hmm. But Russia, but, but Bernie still didn't challenge it, and he still propped it up. And I think looking back now, I mean, maybe there was the political calculation that for him to challenge it, that would be too politically costly. It would be too energy consuming. But I, I think it was a mistake in retrospect because, you know, the Bernie wing let the neoliberals prop up this fake narrative that they use solely to protect their own power and privilege. And I think we'll be living with the consequences of that for a very long time. I think we will too, unfortunately. But fortunately, Aaron, we have people out, like you out there who are at the coalface helping explain all these things, unearth them, and you know, give us the real story. So thank you so much for giving us some of your time joining us here on the Freedom Side. Great to be here. Thanks for having me.